very long time ago, which is appointment setting objections. Uh, you guys, you know, you're on Instagram, you're on YouTube, and you see these salespeople, and they're always teaching you how to overcome objections and how important it is. And it's very important in our business as well. And the thing about Primerica is that because we're in a warm market, a lot of times it's not really that necessary because I recruit Tia, she's setting up with her mom, her mom's not gonna give her that many objections. But what happens is, once you start calling referrals, once you get further and further away from your warm and hot market, you are going to experience normal objections that typical salespeople face. And Dante made this a long time ago. Remember this, Dante, when you made this? Maybe you'll see it when you, you know, you'll remember when you see it. But um, we, we had come together and we thought, all right, what are, what are the best ways to overcome some of the objections that we're getting when we're calling referrals, when we're calling people? And I wanted to go over the, uh, that with you guys today. Um, if you can become a great appointment setter, you know, along with becoming a field trainer, there's no way you're not gonna make a ton of money here. And again, it's that belief that everybody should be meeting with us. So let's talk about some of the uh, objections that we get when we call someone. We already have someone that does that. So we call someone, we say it's financial services, we say we help people reach their goals and retirement, insurance, college, all these different things. And they say, we already have someone that does that. Now we will upload this so you don't have to write everything, but if anything jumps out at you, definitely try to write it down. So when someone says that, did you have someone else that handled your finances before them? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Oh yeah, I have an advisor already, I'm good. Okay, well, did you have someone else that handled your finances before this advisor? Now, if they say yes, well, why did you make that change? See, it's, it's, this is a great question to ask because they're basically admitting to you, we have made a change before. Well, I wanna know why did you make that change? And they're gonna say, well, something along the lines of it was a better program. Okay, so if there was a way to improve your program even further, wouldn't you wanna explore that? So I'm saying, hey, you made a change before, something motivated you to make a change once, Whatever it was that was appealing to you, if we could show you something even better, if we could move your program even further, wouldn't it make sense to at least explore that? And one of the, a really good question that you have to learn to kind of ask everyone when you need to is your family deserves every possible advantage you can offer them, don't they? So that's a good question that you want to memorize. And when someone's not trying to set an appointment, just kind of hit them with that and see what happens. Now, if they say, no, I haven't had someone before this person, well, do you think it'd be worth getting a second opinion if you could accomplish your financial goals sooner? Hey, have you had someone, have you had a plan prior to the one that you have right now? Were you ever working with someone prior? They say no. Okay, well, do you think it'd be worth getting a second opinion if you could accomplish your financial goals sooner? If someone has a, a, a major medical issue, something very important that they're going through medically, we always hear that they're getting a second opinion. Well, how important is our financial situation? Very, very important. Do you think it'd be worth a second look? If it was free of cost, right? If it was complimentary, do you think that it'd be worth it for you to get a second set of eyes on your current plan? Do you think your family deserves that? I think that's a good way to ask it. We don't have any money. This is one that you hear a lot, especially if in the script that you're using, you're talking about insurance, you're talking about investments, and immediately people use this excuse that they don't have any money. And in their mind, they don't, they're not lying. That's why they're not saving, that's why they're not putting money away, they're, they're misallocating their resources, in my opinion, and so this is what, now, in this one, sometimes we're a little bit tougher when they say that, because it's a different type of client. A lot of my clients originally <laughs> thought they didn't have the money before they met me. We actually find ways to free up money so you can save and invest more. And if you don't make the effort, are you ever going to have money? So someone says, look, I don't have the money for a plan right now. Well, actually, a lot of people think that, and now I'm talking to you, right? Why? Because they think we're trying to get them to spend more than what they have, like every other sales company. Well, what we are gonna do is we are going to find the money within your program, and that's how we're gonna help you save and invest more. 
And if we don't make that effort, how are we ever gonna have the money? Look, if I can't find the money in your budget, if I can't find the money in your plan, in your situation, then I'm also not gonna benefit either. So I am incentivized to help to find the money within your budget. How do we find money within a budget? Well, you have whole life. You're spending 200 a month. A term is gonna cost 80 a month. I just found 120, right? You have four credit cards and you're, e you're sending equally 250 to each card to overpay every month. If you guys know about the snowball method, that's the wrong way to pay down debt. I have a more efficient way to do it. Right now you're putting 1,000 towards your debt. What if I showed you how to put 500 towards your debt and my way with less money is gonna help you pay off your debt faster. Now I just found 500 bucks in your budget. Add that to the 120. Now we have 620 to work with, right? Now, good news, you're putting 10% of your 401k, but they're only matching five. How about we bring that down to five, we take that 5% and where should we put it, Sheila? Wrong. Wrong. Now I just found another 5% of your income. We're over $1,000 a month that I found. What's another one? Tax refund? I'm getting a $6,000 a year tax refund. Okay, well, let's increase the deductions on your W2, two. Two, right? Let's increase the deductions. Let's say you have more dependents. Maybe you'll still get 1500 but now you'll be getting a couple hundred dollars, four hundred dollars more in your check because they're taxing you less. We can take that money and now we can put it towards, right? So you thought you didn't have any money, I found fifteen hundred bucks. So this is absolutely the case that we are going to go through the plan and we're gonna find the money and help you save and invest more, but we gotta put that effort in. Or you can just kind of keep saying to yourself, oh, I don't have the money. We're gonna find the money. When we free up money, we can meet and say, hey, I wanna, you know, I just bought a house, I'm trying to figure things out, or I did this, I did that, right, or when this happens. What, what if someone said, I will diet and exercise after I lose 20 pounds? Would that make any sense? <laughs> any, anything like this that sounds a little bit tough, maybe even condescending, it's all about the tone that you use when you say it. Right? If you say it the way I just said it, that sounds very rude. <laughs> but you have to say it like, kind of like a laughing way. Like, did you say that? <laughs> hey, come on, man. Imagine saying X, Y, Z, right? And you say it in a laughing way to kind of soften it. Um, and that's how I would ask that question. But why are we, when we get to the point to where we're saying things like this, it's because it's like a Hail Mary. At that point, the client is not interested and I'm just saying whatever I can to try to see if I can reel them back in. Does that make sense? This is not going to be someone friendly that's motivated to meet and then boom, I just hit them with that. That's it, right? It's gonna come down to me asking these types of questions. I think we are okay. Okay, well, do you know your financial independence number? Do you know the effects of inflation on your retirement? Do you know your debt freedom date, including your mortgage? Are you absolutely positive that your, your investments are allocated in a way to achieve you the highest rate of return and help you reach your retirement goals? Sometimes I don't even wait for an answer. I'll ask all of these at the same time and then see what they say. I don't want to buy anything. I understand how you feel. That's why when we meet, you can't buy anything. And I'll explain this in a second. The purpose is for me to get some information in your hands. If something piques your interest, we can get together down the road. Fair enough? So when somebody says that they don't wanna buy anything, I still want to meet with them, but I'll probably not try to close them right away like I would with someone else. You know, if Ricardo's family members are like, this is what we've been looking for, this is what we want, we're so happy. Of course, the, the way that appointment was set, the way that that went, that person, they're inviting a transaction. But if someone has their guard up, I'm gonna say, no, 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 you can't even buy anything the first time that we meet. I'm just gonna get some information in your hand. Now, if something piques your interest, we can meet again. But I'm telling you right now, I'm not coming for you to buy anything. That's not how my system works. You can't buy anything. I'm feeling you out, you're feeling me out. I don't even know if you're the appropriate client for me. 
right? I don't even know if there's anything I can offer that can help you, right? But I want to see. Don't you think your family deserves that if we can put something together? Can you send me information? This is a really good one. I'd like to see people using this. Um, and you can use this on when people ask information about the company for an interview for like a recruit or for the client stuff as well. I could, but I found that the info is of no value unless I can expand on the content. So usually people have even more questions after looking over brochures, and then I'm not even there to answer them. Can you see how that would be problematic? There is no, number one, when someone sends more information, if they, look, when someone asks for more, like, hey, send me something, that is a tactic to say, that's a very polite way to say I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as new people, we believe that they actually want more information. They don't want more information. If they wanted information, we could simply meet and we could give them the information, right? So this is sort of a stall tactic. So what we say is, well, the information, if I send it to you, really has no value if I can't expand on what you're looking at. A lot of times when I send people the brochures, it brings up even more questions, and I'm not even there to answer it. So can you see how that's a problem? How about whatever information I would have sent you, I sit down and we go over it together. How about that? That way, whatever questions you have, I'll be there to answer it. Does that, does that make sense? What's better for you, Tuesday or Wednesday? And you always end with that alternate choice to set that appointment. I'm not interested. What exactly is it you're not interested in? I can understand you're not being interested, especially in something you haven't seen yet. But would you rather make a decision with a little bit of information or a lot? The only thing I ask is I get you the info before you decide whether or not you're interested. Does that sound fair? <coughs> but what are you not interested in? How do you usually operate? Do you typically make decisions on all the information or very little information? How do you usually operate? All the information? Okay. So how about I just give you the information, then you can make a decision of whether you're interested or not. Does that make sense? I mean, your, your friend John, who referred, he, he found this interesting. He found it valuable. That's why he referred you. Is this the last one or just more? Because I have some of my head that two more. Good. If they believe it will be a waste of time. I get the feeling you think our getting together will be a waste of time, is that right? I'll tell you what, if after 20 minutes you don't see any value, or I don't feel I can improve your situation, I'll leave. It won't cost you a dime. So this is obviously for an in-person, for a Zoom, you can kind of change it, I'll log off or we can end it. So look, I, I kind of feel like you're giving me a lot of resistance because you think this is gonna be a waste of your time. How about this? Just give me 20 minutes. If at that point you don't want me to continue, we'll end the meeting. Does that sound fair? Just give me 20 minutes. If they believe you're just trying to sell them. I get the feeling you think if we get together, I'm gonna to try to sell you something, is that right? Let me assure you, when we get together, you can't buy anything. And by the way, I wanna, I wanna clarify this. When Dante and I first got in the business, we were not allowed to do business with someone on the first meeting. That's why we said stuff like this. Today it sounds a little bit funny because our the, the new way of doing business is if the person needs it, they're gonna get it as soon as you meet with them. That's become a normal thing. I still believe though, there are certain types of clients where it is going to be a multiple appointment strategy. So depending on who you're talking to, I think this is very appropriate to say you can't buy it. The, when you're doing a more complex financial plan or with certain types of clients, your job is to gather data, right? Then you have to do your research, you have to come back with a plan, the plan is gonna show them what they need. Does that make sense? So there's nothing to buy because we haven't, we haven't done their needs analysis yet. And that's why we were saying things like this. But I think you can still use it. If someone really has their wall up and they're worried about this, say, look, in the first meeting, you can't even buy anything. If you're interested, we're gonna meet again, and we're only gonna meet again if you allow me to meet again, which means that you're interested, right? So there's nothing to worry about. I have an accountant CPA. This is an annoying one. 
And when I was when I was young, I would be like, oh, an accountant, right? Or oh, my friend's a lawyer. People will throw out these these things just to kind of posture themselves and kind of push you back and intimidate you, right? So if you don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, what does a CPA have to do with financial planning? CPA stands for Certified Public Accountant meaning they're trained and certified to do the accounting for publicly traded companies. They learn debits and credits, not personal finance. Lawyers, CPAs, bankers are all highly trained and professional. But just as I'm sure I couldn't do their job, they can't do mine. If they could, wouldn't more than 1% be retiring wealthy? Um, but let me, let me just tell you, I've met with many attorneys that have IUL. Their job is to, an attorney's job is to read and write contracts. They didn't read their own contract. Yeah. I've had attorneys where, you know, I was field training their very young son or daughter and they didn't want to be embarrassed and they kind of like got me to leave and not let me look at the policy because they were embarrassed about the fact that they never read it and they didn't want to be exposed about what was in that policy. Um, CPAs and accountants are, the goal of a CPA and accountant, like if, if you talk to most accountants, no matter who the client is, they'll tell them to put money into a traditional IRA. Because their goal, at, they feel their job is done best if they help people save money on taxes now. Right? right? And our goal is to make sure that 40, 50 years from now, that you have a tax, or 30 years from now, you have a tax-free retirement. And so we don't necessarily believe in the traditional IRA if you qualify for the Roth IRA. So sometimes the, the accountants and financial advisors, we have conflicting goals in terms of short-term and long-term. Is it better to take the deduction now or forego that deduction and get tax-deferred or tax-free growth in the future? Um, I just, one of, one of uh, Josh had an appointment with a guy who had, um, he, he owns a very successful business, your client actually, Medicare's client. And so this guy said, uh, hey, can you guys open up a SEP for me? And I was like, are you allowed to have a SEP? And we went through all this, and I, and, I, and, I, and I went through his situation, he had this many employees, and I was like, look, this is the risk in you having a SEP. And he said, my CPA firm said that I can have a SEP, and they already filed my taxes as if I had already made the contribution. And I said, dude, you can't have a set. Right. And he goes, well, I'm calling them right now. I was like, call them. So then I get on the phone with the CPA and me and the client on a three-way call, and I said, hey, I don't, you know the tax code better than me, but from my understanding, he can't have a set unless X, Y, Z. And the guy's like, oh, uh, I didn't know he had employees. I'm like, you're a CPA doing his taxes. You don't know his, his business has any employees. The dude is just lying. Right? And then I'm like, no, the way it works is boom, 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 boom. And he's like, yeah, yeah I'm familiar. Yeah, okay, look, uh, let me look more into this. I'll call you back. Doesn't know anything. Oh my God. This is a tax firm. Right. Right? Now this guy has to amend his taxes. He has to redo his taxes because of this mistake. I mean, by the same guy, but don't be, don't be intimidated. Just say, look, I just want to meet. I'm sure you have a CPA. Hey, why don't I show you the plan and you can have them review it, right? But I still want to meet with you. XYZ, your family deserves every opportunity that you can potentially offer them. So I think that's it.